Hey everyone, it's Daniel Elwood and Robert Johnson, the Last Nighters, and the Last Nighters can be found on the Launchpad Media, where they're always launching new ideas in your direction. Tonight is episode 98 of the show, and we were talking about the Breaking Bad movie, El Camino. So we're about to apex on this thing, uh, on this continuation of an excellent series by Vince Gilligan. It's a feature-length film depicting the immediate aftermath of the events in the final episode, where Jesse has emerged from the chaos in a daring escape but faces an uncertain future, yet he's willing to pay any price to find freedom. Our guest is Jared Wall of Anarcho Land, where one of his projects is called Breaking Liberty, which is an analysis of the series Breaking Bad from a libertarian perspective, similar to what we do here on this show, but in written form. He has two ebooks out now and will be releasing a third in the near future. He was featured on Free Man Beyond the Wall podcast about a month ago. I will put that on our show notes page at lastnighters.com slash 98. And uh, welcome to the show, Jared. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself to the audience and uh, then we can get it going on this uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Um, I, I don't know uh, what more could be said besides the introduction you gave me. I appreciate that. I do have, uh, I've been a fan of Breaking Bad for a long time. And when I rewatched it with my wife, uh, she had never watched it before. And I convinced her to watch it with me a second time. And as I was doing that, I kept uh, being that annoying libertarian who kept pointing out all of the, the faults of the state and the, the beauties of the free market that were popping up in that show. And so I just decided to kind of go with it as we were watching it. And I, I took a bunch of notes and wrote a bunch of essays and then compiled them into, like you said, a couple of eBooks. And I was really excited when I saw that they were coming out with this El Camino movie to kind of put a bow on the, on the end of Breaking Bad. And uh, I really enjoyed it. It didn't really, it didn't disappoint for me. Yeah. I, I thought that the series ended really well, but then there actually was room for something like this. And uh, I watched this last night and I was, I was quite pleased. You know, I was a fan of, of Breaking Bad and I thought that, you know, it ended well enough, but then you throw this on there and now you actually have a little bit more of the resolution, which is uh, kind of a nice feeling. Um, now, related to when you were starting your project, when what was the moment when you decided that you wanted to no longer just be annoying your wife, but annoy <laughs> other people with your writing? Um, was it like the the split second flash of a Ron Paul bumper sticker? Um, I remember. That I did enjoy much. that. That uh, the the character Gale um, described himself as a libertarian, and and his first cook with uh, with Walt in that underground laboratory. He goes on kind of a little uh, uh, rant, for lack of a better word, of why he's a libertarian and um, you know how somebody's going to sell meth, and if somebody's going to do it, it might as well be him. And with him, at least he knows that there's no adulterants or uh, nasty chemicals that are going to get you sick. So he went on this kind of libertarian uh, escapade as to why he was okay with being a meth cook. And uh, I enjoyed that. But I don't know, it was really right from the the opening scene of or the opening episode of the show. Um, you know, with the the SWAT, the the DEA basically SWAT raid of the meth lab that Walt goes on the ride along with. And it just shows the the way over militarization of police and how they make crimes out of non-crimes and they make non-dangerous situations dangerous. And uh, so I just, I pulled out a notepad and I took notes of the entire five, ep five seasons of the show as my wife went through it over the course of like a month or month and a half. And, and then over time after that, that turned into, turned into breaking Liberty. All right. Yeah, it sounds very cool. And Gail, Gail's argument almost reminds me of Mark Thornton, where he talks about how in a free market, you'd have uh, more guarantees of purity, um, you know, and better quality control as other, you know, suppliers are competing on the market. So that that, that is a good argument, I think. Um, now, how we usually start this off is we read off the Google description. So I'll do that and then go to Robert for his reaction. Then we'll come back to you, Jared. And uh, again, thank you for uh, joining us for this show. Uh, so the description is El Camino, a Breaking Bad movie. Came out 2019 drama crime film, uh, two hours and two minutes, available on Netflix. Got a 7.5 on the IMDb, 90% Rotten Tomatoes, 72% Metacritic, and 86% of Google users like it. The Netflix event, El Camino, a Breaking Bad movie, reunites fans with Jesse Pinkman, played by Emmy winner Aaron Paul. In the wake of his dramatic escape from captivity, Jesse must come to terms with his past in order to forge some kind of future. The gripping thriller is written and directed by Vince Gilligan, the creator of Breaking Bad. This just came out about a month ago, um, October 11, 2019. Director is Vince Gilligan, based on Breaking Bad. And uh, the same um, crew that shot Breaking Bad and also Better Call Saul is the crew that created this. 
and it reunites a lot of the uh, characters as it interweaves some of the uh, past history of the series, fills in a couple of Easter egg moments, and uh, and it's it's kind of a nice uh, little mini high school reunion, I think. Uh, Robert, what's your take on the description and and uh, what's your opening salvo? I know you usually got something brewing over there. Well, yeah, I I have mixed emotions, mixed feelings about this film. Um, it it as a standalone movie. I think it has some problem. It's a very non-conventional story as a standalone film. Like it, it kind of requires you to know these characters and know the lead up. Like I hadn't watched the Breaking Bad in quite a while. It's been a good three, four years for me, maybe more. And maybe like five years since I watched that series. Now, Breaking Bad is one of my all-time favorite TV shows. All time. I thought start to finish, the quality was maintained the entire time with maybe the slight dips here and there. But like for a show that sticks the landing and just provides nonstop entertainment, I thought it was incredible. And as a companion piece that, like you said, bow ties, bookends the whole show, I think it works really well. But for me, coming back to it after five years or so, I was like, now, wait a minute. Who's that? Who's this? I remember Jesse. But I didn't remember who had kidnapped him or why. But then, you know, those, those, so in that sense, it kind of worked as a mystery. Like, what, why? Oh, yeah, that's right. Those guys had kidnapped him to cook meth for him. And oh, yeah. And okay, this and that. Um, but another problem that I, I guess my main problem with the film was, and maybe it's because I wasn't really, I'm just, maybe I'm just stupid, but, and that's always a possibility. <laughs> I but, concur. <laughs> Yes, but I didn't really feel like I knew what Jesse's plan was. I didn't know what he was doing. I didn't know what his goal was in the film. Like, I got it that he wanted to avoid the cops. And, you know, some at one point, some guy's like, you know, why don't you try Alaska? And so then it becomes, okay, then I guess I'm going to go to Alaska. But I guess I didn't understand or I didn't feel like I knew what he was trying to do other than stay alive and, you know, get money. But I didn't know that okay, he needs this much money to buy the services of the guy. Maybe if I had watched the last season of Breaking Bad again, I'm sure this film would have been like, oh yeah, of course, that's what he's doing. He's just continuing. He's going to the guy, the vacuum cleaner guy, and he's going to do that. And he owes, yeah, it's going to be 125 grand. And that's why he's doing that. But for me, not remembering any of that stuff, I was, it, was, it, was, it was played out like a mystery. And, but it wasn't, it wasn't, shot like a mystery it wasn't shot like oh and here's a big reveal about this and this is why he's doing that it just kind of happened that way so for me it didn't quite work but only because that those reasons um but i really did enjoy jesse i thought um it was nice to see those characters again and of course like like we said in the intro and whatnot um i mean the cops they they take you know normal situations and make them horrifically dangerous and the, the arbitrariness to which, you know, some drugs are bad and some drugs are fine and that we're going to make people that make these drugs bad and then people that make these drugs are perfectly legitimate, upstanding individuals. It's also arbitrary and bullshit. And that's, I guess, I don't know if that's, you know, the Breaking Bad universe kind of paints that picture, but I guess, you know, it's really obvious for us libertarians. Yeah, I'm going to agree with a lot of your sentiments. I also was lost for much of the film in watching this and then... uh when I was done watching it, I noticed it played a behind the scenes. If you like go all the way through the credits on Netflix. And then if you watch that, it fills in a little bit more. It's only like 10 or 15 minutes. And then there's also a um, previously on kind of like little three minutes recap of basically the lead up to this end point of the story that is buried in the menu on Netflix. Um, it's oh. in the trailers and more section. And honestly, if they had just plugged that three minutes into the front of this movie or made it prominent that, hey, in case you want a little recap, click this. That's strange, because when I watched it, that that was the first thing that played when I kicked play on El Camino on Netflix was that three minute recap of Breaking Bad. And then it went into El Camino. Oh, wow. Uh, OK, well, I watched so it just I, last night. So maybe maybe they since changed it or something, but maybe. Yeah, because I did find myself or like maybe that that uh, alleged person that might be sharing your Netflix account uh, <laughs> saved it at the wrong location on you or something like that. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah, that could be that that could be one of the prices I've paid for that uh, potential uh, alleged transgression. Yeah, that makes <laughs> sense. 
Um, but yeah, so so as a result, I too was finding myself a little bit confused. And then did either of you guys also like not place Todd right away? He looked totally different. I thought it was like Phil, Philip Seymour Hoffman, even though he's dead. Um, but I was like, all right, who's Todd? You know, because he, he looks completely different than when he was in the series five, six years ago. Yeah, Fat Todd was a little bit uh, tough to get used to. Um, and because like, because he, he looked so much older than he did in the show, it kept making me feel like this was a, a sequel as opposed to having happened like during the timeline of Breaking Bad. And I kept having to kind of remind myself as to where in the storyline we were. Um, right, yeah, because Todd originally dies, spoilers everyone, in the last episode, Jesse kills him, uh, strangles him, but it's young, skinny Todd. Right. Yeah. So fat Todd kind of, Hey, you know what? You got to take a, uh, take what you get, you know, with these prequels that are made after the fact, uh, I don't know if you watch better call Saul at all, but that's kind of a similar situation where Gus and Tuco and everybody are much older in better call Saul than they were in breaking bad, but it's set before breaking bad. So it's kind of, it's a, kind of a mind trip to, to keep straight to where everything is and where everything lines up. Right. Yeah. Now, Christian Bale would have been like, I'm going to lose this weight and get like super skinny <laughs> again before I take on this role, or I'm going to get real big and fat and, you know, play Dick Cheney or whatever. Like that guy is like a freaking chameleon when it comes to modifying his body. Same with uh, McConaughey. Like when he did Dallas Buyers Club, he got like super, super skinny. Um, and, you know, he's been kind of all over the map. I think one of his movies, uh, he got kind of fat for it. Um, I think it was called Gold. I didn't watch I it. I loved Gold. Is it that I good? I loved Gold. It's really good. Okay, awesome. Well, we'll have to check that out at some point. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I would be happy to come on and discuss gold with you. I really liked it. Okay, that good. All right. All right. Well, I'll put it in the uh, in the old hopper there. Um, so, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to start saying A little tangent there. <laughs> right away. But uh, what's your take on the Google description and then any of the uh, stuff that Robert had said? Um, I mean, the... The description was accurate. Uh, I think a lot of what Robert said was also accurate. I, I, I kind of uh, went pretty deep into the Breaking Bad world over, uh, you know, the last I don't know decade or so. So it was all very fresh, um, and especially because I had that three minute, you know, uh, refresher before El Camino actually started. I didn't really find that I had the same problems that Robert was discussing. As far as you know, not knowing what Jesse was doing, I knew I knew he would, the whole time that he was you know he was going to go try and find the vacuum or cleaner repair guy, and you know the disappearer and try and get out of there that way. Um, but definitely as a standalone movie, you know you can't you couldn't just go and watch El Camino if you hadn't watched Breaking Bad. I don't think, and I think even Vince Gilligan had come out and said that before the movie came out. So you know you're not really going to enjoy it if you haven't watched Breaking Bad. Um, so it was yeah. it was very much so meant for Breaking Bad watchers. Uh, but you know, it's, uh, I, I really enjoyed it. There wasn't, it was going to be, it was always going to be hard for me not to like it being such a fan of breaking bad and that whole world. Um, I guess the only, the only knock on it that I would give is I felt that both of the throwback scenes with, uh, Mike Ehrmantraut and with Walt were unnecessary and kind of forced. Um, it just felt like, you know, just kind of an excuse to get those characters back in the movie, but that's kind of a minor thing. It was it was nice seeing those characters. I just didn't think it was necessary in the story that they were trying to tell of of Jesse here at the end. See, I'm going to disagree with you there. I thought that they were necessary in just planting the seed of the idea for Jesse. One with Ermintrout was where to go. Well, Alaska True. was one that he suggested. And then uh, Walt was trying to ask Jesse, well, what about your future? You're a young guy. You're making a bunch of money. What are you going to do now? Um, and, and I love that he brought up college and Jesse was like, college? I don't need to go to college. And Walt's like, well, you go to business, you know, get a business degree. And, and my thought that whole time was like, no, no, you, you go get a business degree if you don't know how to do or, you know, if, if you're not good at anything, if, you, if you're not actually right. out there doing something, you know, you, then you go waste. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to be super offensive here, but you waste a bunch of money and time going to college, learning a bunch of crap from a bunch of Marxists uh, rather than going out and actually doing something productive in the world. Um, we've got kids and they're young. And so in my mind, you know, we're, we're trying to raise them in an unschooling environment and we want them to get that entrepreneurial spirit early on and, and do something that's productive and, uh, you know, maybe go to college if they want to specialize in something specific, but not just go for the sake of going like I did. Like I went because it was the next thing. I didn't go for any particular, you know, particular unique skill that I could only have acquired there. So that's my little 
side rant on that. Um, Robert, I'll kick it to you. Maybe your college experience, because we went to college together. Did you have something similar or different? And what were your thoughts during the film when Walt was telling Jesse to go to college? Oh, this is very similar to you. And, and I'm glad Jesse had that same response. Like, what? What do I need that for? I'm already, I already know how to make a ton of money. I already know how to run a business. And then he's like, well, yeah, you could teach the class. It's like, okay, well, then what am I learning? If I could already teach the class and go to business college, I could just not go and <laughs> save uh, what, that 4000 a year. Yeah, save the money and save the time. And like, okay, I'd have a degree at the end of it. But I mean, those are rapidly losing value with everybody and their mother going to college. So, eh. Um, as far as my own college experience, yeah, very similar to you, Daniel. I didn't have that kind of guidance that, you know, go to learn a skill that you don't know how to do and, you know, something that'll add value to your, you know, portfolio, what have you. I went because it was the next thing to do for the most part. And then I went and, you know, I studied art and I think I, it helped me get better at art, but not in any, I mean, I had a good time in college. I'm not going to say I didn't. Um, and I think a lot of people use college as just a place to socialize and network and, you know, have a good time um, and less to really study and learn something that they couldn't learn otherwise. I mean, with all the tools that we have available to us today to go to college and spend all that money and time, it's a tough sell. I mean, I think a lot of kids just go because their friends are going and that's just what you do. That's what I did. And uh, yeah, it was turned out to be kind of a waste of time. I mean, I, I put it to some use and I think, you know, I, I, learned, I know a few things that I didn't know beforehand, but nothing that I couldn't have learned on my own or especially with the internet these days. I mean, forget about it. Yeah. Yeah. So. I like, I like the, uh, the, what you guys are saying about entrepreneur, entrepreneurship and whatnot. And that's, uh, as opposed to, you know, try, trying to become, get an entrepreneurial mindset and start building something for yourself as opposed to, you know, continuing through the, the pipe of, you know, mainstream education and into the university system and then hoping that somebody gets, gives you a job as opposed to building something for yourself in the, in the, in the show and in the movie too. I mean, two of the more fun characters are, uh, you know, the vacuum cleaner repair guy and, um, old Joe, the guy who owns the, the, uh, old car lot, uh, who has got the crusher and he, he was the guy with the magnets at the, at the, during the, during breaking bad. If you remember that scene. Yeah, bitch. Those, <laughs> yeah. Magnets. Science. <laughs> Science. Uh, but no, both of those characters, you know, and their, their business acumen and, um, you know, they're not taking, uh, any BS and things like that. I, I liked both of those characters. I especially liked kind of touching on the, the college, uh, narrative that we're going down here is when, uh, when Jesse first went to the backland cleaner repair guy, he was like, it was $125,000 that he needed. And he was like $1,400 short or something like that. And he tried playing to the guy's emotions he tried saying have you seen the news did you see what they did to me how they had me locked in a cage and treated me as a slave and all that and the repair guy basically said like yeah suck it up like you, you can't play on my emotions to get what you want he's like as far as i'm concerned you know you 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 made your own bed you got involved in that life and you ended up where you ended up it's your own fault i'm not, I'm not gonna give you a discount because i feel bad for you it was kind of a very uh anti-sjw type of uh type of sh speech that he gave Jesse there when he was trying to, to get a little bit of a deal. Yeah. As was the uh, phone call Jesse gave to his parents when he was like, you know, you did your best and how I turned out that's on me. I thought that was yeah. pretty cool. Yep. Took some responsibility for himself in his own situation. Absolutely. That's what that's, you know, and um, you know, responsible, personal responsibility. You know, that's a big libertarian shtick. And uh, you know, I think, I think just the, the opening scene of the movie when Jesse shows up at Skinny Pete's house and Skinny Pete and Badger kind of help him out of his situation and basically just it would everybody deserves to have friends like Skinny Pete and Badger basically and it kind of to me it showed that personal relationships and friendships and things like that are far more important and will do far more to help people in need than the government ever could. Yeah, these are all excellent points. And I just want to go back to the vacuum cleaner guy. Uh, I would have probably given Jesse the $1,800 discount because he just gave me 240 <laughs> grand or so. I would have been like, all right, close enough. But <laughs> I also think it was a teaching moment. Now, I would have not expected Jesse to survive much longer without my help. 
So I don't know how much effective that teaching moment would have been. Um, but I also thought it was funny when uh, when he called the police and Jesse thought it was not a real phone call. and was like trying to call his bluff. And then it turns out that he <laughs> he was wrong and the cops did show up, which was kind of funny. And then, but then he, he sent the cops down like a, a rabbit hole going in like a totally different direction than Jesse. He, you know, he, the description that he gave the cops of who the person was, was like the complete opposite of what Jesse looked like. So he 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 didn't give him a break. But at the same time, he kind of had his back a little bit. Yeah. And in fact, that might have actually helped him because then the cops would be focused on looking for someone else in particular as opposed to Jesse, um, had that not even occurred. And then with uh, Jesse calling his parents, it was kind of a nice thing for him to accept the responsibility for how he turned out himself and not blame his parents per se. But he was also <laughs> using that moment to deceive his parents to get them out of the house. Now, Jared, maybe you can clarify, what was he hoping to acquire or achieve by getting his parents out of the house? Was he trying to find the 1800 bucks in there? And he was he didn't find it. And then he, you know, he found the 22 and and the little revolver. Or was he there getting the 22 and the revolver? Was that like his goal? I had the same question. And I actually joined a Facebook group specifically for Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul fans to ask that question and see what other people thought. And most people in there were thinking that he went there thinking that he would find the 1800 in cash and just instead found these two guns and then had it, you know, changed his plans accordingly. Uh, you know, I, I had the, I thought he went there initially. I thought that he had went there specifically for the guns, but then I thought, you know, why go through all that trouble of having this fake phone call to his parents and deceiving them and all that to get them out of the house, as opposed to just going into a gun store and buying a couple of guns. But then at the same time, so somebody pointed out to me that, you know, he's a fugitive on the run. You can't just show his face, you know, going into a gun shop, et cetera. So it's, it's kind of up in the air. I don't really know what the answer is, but um, he uh, he ended up getting the, that funny. That was kind of a funny scene. There was a little bit of a, the, the, the shootout that ended up happening. I thought it was it was kind of goofy, uh, you know, with the, the Wild West uh, duel type of standoff. But, um, you know, he, he made it through and uh, it was it was entertaining. Yeah, I would have to say that a guy like Jesse Pinkman probably knows a dozen guys he could get a gun from at any given time in that town. But I mean, he's been dealing he's been dealing meth for years at that point. Right. There's even a scene in Breaking Bad, I think, right in the opening season where he does buy like a black market gun. So, yeah, it it definitely would have been possible for him. So I think he was going there for the money of uh, originally. And I don't think he wanted to. I don't yeah, think Jesse liked a little surprised to see those guns. I mean, maybe he was surprised to see those particular guns, but yeah, I think he was looking for other kind of valuable in my opinion. Yeah. Well, I also thought he could have gone anywhere else for the money. I mean, if he had been a dealer and, and did know all these people, I mean, Badger and skinny Pete, who are great characters, by the way, that was a nice reminisce, uh, with Definitely. her, with her I'm apex to get the apex, bitch. She's driving like Miss Daisy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, so yeah, the whole going to the parents thing, I think it almost was just a plot contrivance to get the parents into the movie. Because I think he could he could have gotten the money or guns from other sources easier than misleading his parents, calling off the surveillance. And there were still a, a couple of cops waiting at the house, keeping an eye on things. So I think that puts him at tremendous risk uh, compared to going, you know, various other channels that I'm sure he would have been aware of. Yeah, it was definitely convenient for the movie to get the the parents back involved. I, I, um, I watched that that making of thing too that you alluded to, and uh, when when those two characters got the script and realized that they were going to be involved, they were both kind of surprised. But, and uh, yeah, I think I think you're probably right. It was kind of just a, a way to get them into the movie, and there would have definitely been better and other ways for Jesse to get what he needed, whether it was guns or money. Right. But I guess on the other side of it, you know, he did want to have some closure because he did have, as depicted in the series itself, you know, a very tumultuous relationship with his parents. And since we're bookending and closing out the entire series here, he's trying to come to a resolution and kind of do his his goodbyes as he heads off to Alaska to start over, start a new life with no money, <laughs> no prospects. Uh, so I'm not sure how well he would fare up there. Maybe maybe they'll do a, a continuation <laughs> with Jesse to be a lumberjack or something. <laughs> yeah, he he. What did he end up? He ended up uh, up in Alaska with that other guy's bag of money. So he went up there. Probably had I don't know two hundred thousand dollars on him, three hundred thousand dollars on him. That lasts a ways. That would last him a little while, especially in Alaska. 
Yeah. Now back to the shootout. I mean, I, I think it was, you know, to, to add a little Western uh, nod or whatever, you know, like a little bit of flair to make it into a old West style shootout style thing. But um, I thought it was ridiculous that that even came up like that. The guy who um, he was the bad guy in uh, what is it? The Righteous Gemstones on HBO. Have you guys oh, seen yeah, that? yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he, he was the welder guy and he was like, OK, well, let's do a shootout. You know, your your bag of money for my bag of money. I mean, I guess he was coked out and, and he saw a 22 pointed at him and was like, ah, I can even if it hits me, it's not going to hurt me. Right. Yeah. And and Jesse, you know, yeah, sure. He cheated. But, you know, I don't think I blame him in this case. <laughs> no. And in a, in, a, uh, in a game that's life or death, I don't really think there is cheating. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Love and war. There's no rules. Right. Exactly. Um, now, I wonder, did Jesse perhaps expect something like that to happen? And that's why he was showing the 22. Like, what do you think his plan was going to the uh, welder's um, place of business in the middle of the night? I, I thought that he was seeking the money and he didn't expect anyone to be there or only just the one guy. And then there's a whole group of guys and strippers and the whole thing. So it, of course, thwarted his plan. But I can't imagine that he had thought, oh, I'm going to show that I have a 22 so that that'll in, induce this guy to try to have a shootout with me, you know, a duel Alex Han- <laughs> Alexander Hamilton style, Aaron Burr style. <laughs> um, and then, you know, then I'll shoot him with the revolver. Uh, I mean, do you think that this is just Vince Gilligan trying to add something a little bit funny and spicy and Western-y um, that just really doesn't have any realm of credibility, like if, that this could actually happen? I don't know. Uh, Robert, what do you think? I don't know. I mean, uh, I see Dan's point. I really do. It does seem like it's a little too convenient that he walked in there and had the the two guns showing just the one and it all worked out. Um, it kind of, it, it, the scene kind of worked for me though. It, it felt like a, except for the fact that I didn't have any idea of what Jesse's plan was going to, I wish I had known more. Like usually in a movie, there will be two characters or we'll get a scene where he's like writing something down on a piece of paper, something to convey to the audience what his plan is, but we don't get anything. We just have him sit standing there kind of creepily stalking everybody in this place while they're you know getting hookers and whatnot. So yeah, what his plan exactly was. Uh, yeah. I think it's like what you said, um, hoping to go there and there's not be anybody there and he could just creep in there and search the place like he did uh, Todd's house. And then, yeah, maybe try to convince them that, you know, hey, 1800 bucks. Like he tried. He walked in there showing the gun, but he was That's basically true. like, come on, I, I just need 1800 and I'm gone forever. You, you're never going to see me again and you're not going to miss 1800 And we just robbed a guy for, you know, a million or whatever. And, you know, where, where's your humanity here? But then the other guy's like, man, if you give this guy $1. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I guess I, I, I agree. I think uh, it's kind of just happenstance that, you know, they were having the strippers and cocaine party when he was trying to break in there that's a little bit of a kind of a, the the strippers are kind of a funny easter egg to uh to better call Saul that um that bouncer that comes with them is a is a is in a scene in better call Saul that's really funny i'm not gonna get into all that but uh he he's elsewhere in the breaking bad world and that was kind of funny to see him show up in this movie Oh, yeah, yeah in, the, in the cocaine party with the hookers, I mean, it seemed completely reasonable. Like, these guys just had a huge score. You know, they're going to want to party. So, and that was perfectly reasonable. But as far as Pinkman, yeah, just so happened to have everything work out. I like the gunshot, the gunfight itself. Like, other than the maybe the guy, the welder guy going, hey, yeah, let's, I'll, I mean, you know, he did have the 45, and I would put take a 45 against a 22. Thank you very much. <laughs> 100 times out of 100 at that range. Yeah, I mean, they were what, maybe twenty feet apart? Not, not very far. Yeah, if that. Yeah. So yeah, that range is it's going to be hard to miss. Although they were, you know, your blood's up and you're all excited and your adrenaline's pumping and and you're yipped on cocaine. Yeah, you're yipped on cocaine, so maybe you're not going to be the most accurate. I mean, when the other guy grabbed that, <laughs> I did yeah. like how he uh, alpha dogged the ginger though. Got him to calm the fuck down. <laughs> you know, didn't even have to say anything that, you know, I, I, he's, he told him to shut up like twice and then he just menaced him. Yeah, he went nose to nose with him. It was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, so that was pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, as far as like Jesse's plan, in retrospect, now that I've seen it and, and I recollect that the guy who was extracting him um, and who was a very stickler guy, deals a deal, 
um, that becomes more clear what Jesse's plan is. And I think that maybe perhaps he did learn a lesson from that, from the vacuum cleaner guy, because he did go to these guys and say, like you said, Hey, 1800 and I'm out of your life forever. You've still got, you know, half a million or however much. Um, I just need, you know, this little favor. Uh, and he would, he would have grabbed it from Tom's Todd's apartment had the, the other dude, the welder guy, not, you know, stopped him from collecting any additional. Right. I mean, you kind of had to have that happen for the movie to work, but, um, but I did like, you know, the vacuum cleaner guy and Jesse being very much men of their word at, uh, at this stage. And, you know, and Jesse throughout the series, he was kind of this goof off, screw up, lying all the time guy. And by the end of it, you know, he's, he's actually matured and, and become a far more upstanding guy. And uh, they even talk about how he failed to leave the first time with the vacuum guy. And then he went through this harrowing experience of months of being this slave to uh, these guys um, uh, in the uh, in the little documentary thing. He calls them not he calls them Nazis, but they're they're just basically a gang. Uncle Joe was like the leader, and Todd was the nephew, and and they're making Jesse cook for him, uh, and then you know keeping him underground in a cage and really just kind of torturing him. I I, I can imagine it was almost maybe what's happening to, to someone like Julian Assange these days, which is just despicable and very, very horrible. Um, and we've talked about this, Robert, on a couple of recent episodes. That it's it's really ridiculous how the crimes themselves that are exposed are almost an afterthought. And it's the fact that the crimes got exposed that everyone's upset about. Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, that's these days. That's exactly what's happening. Except for when the exposer exposes some, you know, Trump thing, then everybody's like, why do we need to know who this whistleblower is? But, you know, Julius Assange and everybody else, they're exposing like war crimes, then, oh, these people are bad. Yeah. But um, well, I did traitors. appreciate, I did appreciate in this film how much offense and how horrific um, Jesse, you know, describing his experience being imprisoned. He's like, they kept me in a cage like an animal. It's like, yeah, no, that sounds like prison. That's, that's what the state does to people they lock them in cages and treat them like animals yeah so yeah i i appreciate that they were like you know no this is this is a horrific thing that human beings do to each other do we want to talk about uh just the concept of slavery in general sure that yeah. sounds good i thought that that might be kind of an interesting topic to pull out of this this movie uh i mean i guess um you know th there's that that uh that thought exercise that i, I think i first read it on lourockwell.com a while back but it was you know the at what point is it no longer slavery so say say uncle jack and his guys you know didn't keep him locked up and tortured him uh, you know 24 hours a day seven days a week maybe they gave him you know two days off where he could go and do his own thing what he wanted you know but those other five days he had to come back and cook or else type thing you know at what point does it stop becoming slavery and then you know that's always analogous to the state and uh, taxation and the war on drugs and things like that. And uh, I found that, uh, you know, I always I've found that thought exercise to be very compelling personally. Um, and I think, you know, the, 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 the treatment of Jesse uh, and comparing, you know, the neo-Nazis who were holding him to kind of the actions of the government sometimes is, is a fair analogy. Yeah, that's uh, Robert Nozick's Tale of the Slave. And there's a, um, a YouTube video of that where Tom Woods is reading it. And I can put that on our show notes page. It's actually really good. Uh, so go to lastnighters.com slash 98 and you guys can check that out. It's only uh, five or 10 minutes, so pretty brief. It's a, it makes a very compelling argument. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it just keeps going up uh, um, one level of additional freedom. And then the final question is, at what point were you no longer a slave? And it's really hard to pick a point. Yeah, I've I, I've asked that question. I've you know I've basically spelled that out on uh, social media before and asked that question, and people will you know have the pithy response, you know, well, well, I'd prefer than the the latter than the former, but they don't really have a non arbitrary answer. Yeah, right. Yeah, and and to your point, you know, if if they had made Jesse cook for five days and on the weekends, took him out to go bury cleaning ladies, uh, which is <laughs> what happened in this movie. So let's let's talk about Todd a little bit. Uh, Fat Todd, who used to be Skinny Todd. If I recall, and, and they, they show this in a little three-minute you know recollection thing, Todd basically shot this kid on a bike who had maybe witnessed the train robbery, maybe. But there were, you know, 
it wasn't like a for sure thing or, or that the kid even knew what he saw or anything like that. But then Todd just shot him like no, no remorse, no emotion, no hesitation. Like the guy has a really stunted emotional response to things. But in other ways, he's like trying so hard to be normal and trying so hard to talk about things with people. And it, it's um, it's just really a bizarre but well acted um, way. And and actually went to college, not with Robert. Well, I did go to college with Robert, but I went to college with another guy who this Todd character reminds me of in the same kind of emotional <laughs> stuntedness and not quite the sociopath component, but the not sure what to say. So I'll say the thing to not seem weird, but it will seem weird because if I'm saying it as if I'm not trying to be weird, like I'm doing right now, am I, <laughs> did I just go meta on everyone? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? No, I'm right with you. He's a strange, strange character and definitely a sociopath. Uh, if he, maybe if he wasn't so weird, he would make a, a, a good politician. Yeah, there you go. He had more, a little more charisma, not a whole lot more, just a little bit more, a little bit more. Yeah, and then the um, the search through Todd's apartment I thought was actually really cool. Um, and when watching the film, I didn't realize that that was actual footage. I thought that was some computer animation stuff that they threw in there or something like that. You know, when in watching the movie, but then you see the um, the behind the scenes, they're like, "Oh no, we we actually built the set to the size of the frame of the camera, and we mounted the camera forty five feet up, and we shot Jesse searching through each of the rooms, tearing stuff apart." for hours and then compressed it <laughs> all down to like 10 or 15 seconds. And that's what you see. And I mean, it's really effective. It's, it reminded me of the shining with the maze uh, where um, there's the, the model of the maze inside the overlook hotel. And then there's, it ends up being like a crane shot over the actual maze outside of the hotel where Jack ends up freezing to death after chasing Danny. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? You've seen the shining. I do. No, yeah, you're right. Absolutely. No, it was a cool shot, a cool moment in this film, too. Definitely not expected. It's like the only kind of really artsy kind of thing they're doing presentation wise, like director wise. So it kind of stood out. But yeah, it was a cool sequence. Yeah, I, th I thought there was some uh, good cinematography as far as like the vistas, like the shots in the desert and things like that. That I mean, the, the series had that as well. But I think that maybe they pushed it a little bit further in this in the movie version here. Yeah, although, I mean, if you're in a beautiful area, uh, I don't want to sell the cinematographer short, but sometimes their job is a little easier than other times. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, and, and one other thing, uh, Jared, you had mentioned earlier on about the outsized response to things um, on that first raid that Walt saw on the ride along in episode one. Um, you know, we see this parade, like endless, almost endless parade of police cars and armored vehicles going towards Skinny Pete's house. When the El Camino's lowjack gets activated, I mean, what the heck, Jesse? What are you expecting to go find? Yeah, yeah, and Jesse's a person of interest, right? He's not implicated in actually committing the murders, right? That's all pinned on Walt. So what are they? I just didn't understand. And, and I'm not saying that it's not realistic. It probably is. It probably is what they would do. I just don't understand why anyone would just send, I don't know, a hundred people in a hundred vehicles to go and try to find one guy who. Such a waste of resources, huh? Yeah, <laughs> very true. But yeah, like there isn't even a crime that Jesse's suspected of, is there? Maybe stealing the El Camino from a dead guy. I mean, and it was it had been out there in the news that, uh, you know, it, it didn't seem like he was, you know, it, it was known that he wasn't really involved with the murders, that it might have been that he had been liberated, that he had been a slave there. And so all these cops go and to arrest him. Now, I don't know if you guys saw, there was a trailer for El Camino where it shows the scene with Skinny Pete. It did, it, 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 I kept waiting for the scene in the movie, but it never came. It was just in the trailer. But uh, it showed Skinny Pete being interrogated by the cops and him saying like, you know, even if I don't know where Jesse is, but even if I knew where he is, I wouldn't tell you guys because he just got out of a cage. I'm not going to help you guys put him back in a cage. And, you know, so, you know, the, the, what I had said earlier about, we all need friends like Skinny Pete and Badger. I, you know, that's, that trailer was another example of that. Oh, okay. Yeah. I I'd, I'd had liked to have seen something like that in this movie because we just see those cops and armored vehicles going towards Skinny Pete's house. And then that's the end of the Skinny Pete story. Like we don't know what right. happens to him or to Badger um, after, after that. And, and they, they came up with a great plan, you know? Yeah. Let's tell them that we swap pink slips and we'll drop off 
my car down by the border of Mexico to throw him off the scent and all this stuff. Cause Jesse was just going to get the car out of there and just go. Um, but then he would have, you know, of course got, got caught. Yeah. So what do you think of the plot of this film, Daniel? Like, is it, was it, was it fairly compelling to you? I mean, as a lover of the breaking bad universe, I think you could follow it along and like I said, really enjoy all the characters and seeing them again, getting this little bow tie at the end. But I don't know. It, it, I didn't, since I didn't know what was really happening, you know, and, and, and I didn't understand what the goal was that Jesse was working towards. I felt a little bit lost. And then I saw so that I couldn't really like I, I enjoyed the characters and I wanted to watch it. And I wanted to see what happened, but I didn't feel like I was quite along for the ride. I felt more like I was just watching somebody do stuff. Yeah, I, and I'll agree with you in two ways. One is this is definitely not a standalone movie. You need to have at least seen the Breaking Bad series, the entire series before watching this. Uh, and I would add that you should have seen the Breaking Bad series recently. Um, and so what I would recommend if you got the time is watch the entire series again. And then this movie as the apex, and then it would make sense. And it would probably all work together really, really well. Um, because you kind of have to have it, you know, in the recency and in, in your memory a little bit to really understand some of the nuances that are going on here, because it is convoluted and it is flashing back and forth in time. And it's, it's hard to tell exactly when events are occurring or not. Um, you can sort of tell like, okay, Jesse's got the long hair and the beard. So he's, he's in captivity and then he's got the shaved head when he's out. And then there's sort of like some in between. Um, and I think that they had it, they had to go with the shaved head to, uh, to make it like as clear as possible um, to, to be able to tell those things apart. But yeah, I, I'm going to agree with you that, for a Breaking Bad fan who's really up on this stuff, uh, this has a lot of good stuff in it. A lot of good Easter eggs, a lot of nice callbacks and references and and uh, revisits with old characters. I mean, they even bring back Jane, who uh, was Jesse's love interest, um, I think, through the first season or two. And then she she uh, OD'd or, well, Walt played a hand in that, didn't he? Like, she was OD'ing, but Walt was... She, in- she aspirated. Yeah, so Walt was in a position to prevent her from dying but he chose not to, which I think is Walt's one of his greatest sins uh, against Jesse uh, in the entire series. Um, Oh, and, and the other one was when he told the cartel that he wanted Pinkman dead and he said it right in front of Jesse, but then he kind of gave Jesse a wink or a just go with it kind of look. Maybe I'll direct this at you, Jared. Can you clarify, was Walt telling the cartel to kill him knowing they wouldn't so that it would give Jesse a chance to live and maybe they'd come up with a way to make him escape? Or was he really, yeah, kill this guy. Are you talking about in the desert at the end when they killed Hank at the same time? Yeah. Yeah, I I think at that point, he really would have been cool with them killing Jesse. They had Jesse had just tried to burn down his house. There was uh, a lot of bad, bad blood between the two of them. And then when... That that's kind of early on in the final season, and then Walt goes to New Hampshire, and then he comes back and wants to get revenge on the uh, you know the the neo Nazis or you know the Uncle Jack's crew. And I thought I when I first watched that in the Breaking Bad show, I thought he went back there for the purpose of liberating Jesse. But rewatching El Camino, and especially with that three minute uh, recap, I kind of changed my mind on that. I think he went back not just to kill uncle Jack's crew. I think he meant to kill. I think he thought that they had partnered with Jesse and not enslaved Jesse. And so he was going to try and kill all of them. And then when they paraded Jesse in, in the, you know, the ankle chains and the handcuffs and whatnot, Walt kind of had a, a soft spot for him and saved him by, you know, tackling him to the ground as that, uh, automatic, uh, machine gun went off. Uh, so I think I think in in the desert there I think at that point um, he was gonna he really was giving Jesse up. Okay, okay, yeah, and this goes back to you know I I hadn't seen the series in probably three or four years, and for whatever reason the first couple of seasons stand out like I can recall them and remember them a lot better than the final season or two. For whatever reason I don't remember any of the stuff after the uh, <laughs> the really old uh, guy farts in the chair and blows blows him and Gus up. <laughs> That's kind of like that, that, that bomb was the end of my memory of this. Yeah. Season. The, the final couple of seasons of the show go really fast. It's a very fast paced story. I thought, but that's kind of what I liked about it too. Now I would be remiss since we're discussing breaking bad. 
if I didn't ask my favorite question. Every time I talk to somebody that's seen Breaking Bad, I have to ask, at which point did you turn against Walt? I know my point exactly. And I've talked to one other person who said they never turned against Walt. They were with him beginning to end. And that kind of surprised me. But Jared first, and then Daniel, I'd, I'd, I, if you know the time at which you turned against Walt, or if you never did, I, I'd like to know. Yeah, I think I'm in that category of never did. I mean, I, I, you know, now that the whole thing's wrapped up, I kind of, you know, it's obvious that he turned into a despicable person, but uh, it's the way the story is told. It's kind of like that, that uh, sympathetic villain type of character that they build him up into kind of like the Tony Soprano type of character where you're cheering for him, even though he's just a, a psychopathic killer. Uh, I don't, I, I was, I never really turned against Walt by any means. I did think that Jesse was the most moral character of the show out of all the characters, I think. Uh, yeah. But um, I think Walt, I, I never, I never really turned against Walt. Wow. Okay. Daniel. Well, I mentioned it earlier when Walt allows Jane to die when he's in a position to prevent that. Now we know there's no positive obligations. So well, that's really early on. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. When did you turn against them, Robert? Well, let, uh, let me hear Daniel talk about no positive okay. obligations. All right, all right. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, there, there's no, you know, like the, the last uh, episode of Seinfeld where they got put in jail for the good Samaritan law. Um, that that's an illegitimate law. Of course, most laws are. And so while he's not under an obligation to save her, she did put herself in that position by shooting up a bunch of heroin and then aspirating. But he was there and he made the conscious decision to allow her to die. So if there's intent, and I think that does play a role, he intended for her to die as a result of his inaction and was making a choice. And by making a choice, he is doing an action. So that made me turn on Walt. I think that he uh, could have saved her, should have saved her, and was not saving her out of anger or spite at Jesse at that time and ended up, you know, really hurting him and, and killing his uh, the love of his life. I kind of think he killed her out of an act of self-preservation. I think he saw her as a threat, but a potential threat to his you know, to, to the empire that he was in the process of building. He saw her as a potential rat, you know, somebody that he yeah, couldn't like trust. Yeah. 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 So he bush doctrined her. Yeah. <laughs> well, exactly. he didn't necessarily, he didn't make her shoot the cocaine or whatever, the heroin. But yeah, I, I think it's definitely, it was definitely a shitty move. Um, His first instinct, he, he moved to go and try and save her, but then he thought better of it so i mean his his his, the conscious instinct was there but he overrode it so which you know obviously a very scumbag move to just let somebody die yeah because it would benefit him and his plans and his plans for his own family right yeah but yeah well that's that's, interesting um that's when i turned okay well i turned and i remember this specifically was when he killed mike yeah i I hated that yeah i i had really grown to like the mike character i thought he was a really good um kind of uh you know advice giver kind of sage wisdomy kind of guy even though he was a cleaner obviously and he's going to killing people he's not a moral character but the murder of mike was just this cold-blooded senseless just out and out you know murder like he wasn't defending himself he was just like this guy's got to go and i'm gonna take him out and that you couldn't just let him retire you couldn't let him go off into the sunset you couldn't let him do any of that walk you had to be this prick yeah you had to be this control freak murderer guy because my yeah i think i want to i want to i kind of want to change my answer (laughs) because i i do remember hating that so much and i actually wrote about it in my in one of the breaking liberty books about how you know it's kind of like the nature of the war on drugs is that you kind of have to be violent in order to survive in order to grow to the level that walt did and when you you're immersed in violence you kind of just become accustomed to it and it becomes like a Mm. kind of a go-to yeah, this is how you solve problems. So this is what yeah. we do. Yeah. So you know, it, and it had gotten to the point. It, he didn't. He didn't kill Mike really for any good reason at all, other than for being offended at something that Mike said to him. Uh, and you know, to get to that point where you're willing to murder someone over a verbal offense, uh, you know, that's definitely a level of psychopath that it takes that not the normal person gets to. And you know, which Walt, you know, before he turned into Heisenberg, didn't have. But the war on drugs kind of built it into him yeah 
yeah, for sure. No, he definitely got into that Heisenberg mentality and became this other other creature. And yeah, yeah that was. I mean, he did he did some shitty things, no doubt. But that was when I was like, no, this guy's a piece of shit. He's got to go. <laughs> for me, the 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 part, the most evil part of the whole show, I thought, was when Todd killed Andrea, Jesse's second girlfriend. I thought that was the most cold blooded kill in the whole show. And uh, I mean, I never, I didn't really like Todd from the beginning, but that was like, okay, yeah, Todd is the worst character in this show. <laughs> and by worst, you mean like just the worst human being or the worst, worst, exactly, actor. yeah. Because he is interesting uh, as far as compelling to watch. <laughs> I really when when they were driving out to bury the cleaning lady and he was singing that song, I, it was like the one of the most pleasant scenes with like such a dark background behind it that it was just you know it, it really drove home the the psychopath nature of Todd that he's singing that you know that uh, you know um, yacht rock Doctor Hook song and you know trying to get the eighteen wheeler to honk at him and you know just not a care in the world as he's on his way out to bury this cleaning lady that he killed in cold blood. Right. Yeah, Jared, I think you made a really good point when you were talking about how this drug war kind of turned Walt into Heisenberg. It wasn't necessarily that, I mean, maybe he was a bit of a psychopath to begin with, but you get to be, you know, start using this violence as, as you don't have the, you know, the legal system to fall back on to, you know, mitigate and arbitrate you know, disputes and that sorts of thing. You have this tool of violence and that's all you really have other than as terrible other as than mediation option. and arbitration you know, privately. But, but um, yeah, I, I, if, 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 you know, crystal meth were legal, you know, obviously this story doesn't happen. Maybe Walt goes into the business, but then he's just a successful drug manufacturer guy and he's just a successful businessman and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I guess if there's anything to be thankful for about the state, it's that it gives us uh art like Breaking Bad and like The Wire and like The Sopranos and like Sons of Anarchy and things like that. You know, these great TV shows wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the war on drugs and the war on guns and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> the small payment. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's not exactly, it doesn't exactly make up for it, but uh, it's a small thing. Yes, yeah, the silver lining. You got something <laughs> for your tax money there, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> your tax dollars at work. All right. Well, um, we're probably about that time where we need to start winding this down. So we do a final summary and review and we give a score out of 10, a decimal point deep. And then um, we end the show and we get into some Kathleen Turner Overdrive, which is available for our Patreon supporters. It's extra bonus content if you're able to stick around a little bit longer, Jared. And uh, people can get access to that at lastnighters.com slash Patreon. Uh, this is episode 98 of the show. So the show notes is at uh, lastnighters.com slash 98. Uh, but do either of you have any final points before we get into the final summary portion? Nah, I'm G2G, baby. Yeah, I mean, I thought I liked the, the the whole Breaking Bad world and El Camino and Better Call Saul. They all do a really good job of showing the ineptitude of cops. Uh, so I enjoy that. You know, the only way even in El Camino that the cops even had a direction to go in, you know, to go find the El Camino was because a private company's lojack had that, you know, that a private company had created was activated. So it wasn't any impressive police techniques that led them there it was you know a private company's solution that had been purchased voluntarily in the market so i i uh i like that aspect of all the shows and the movies yeah and doesn't hank take like a couple seasons to figure it out and then he's just sitting on the can one day and he like, like yeah far. exactly because he doesn't have the 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 decency not to use somebody else's master bathroom so he goes and is dropping a deuce in walt's master bathroom and happens to pick up that book that gail had given him and when it showed you know it was right in his face the whole time that it it was walt uh he just couldn't see it yeah maybe it's just too close to yeah yeah so um and jared your your last point about the low jack actually reminded me to uh make this comment that i found it surprising how lackadaisical uh, Skinny Pete and Badger and Jesse were to getting the hell out of there when I did too. They knew the low jack was activated. I would have uh, thought that the response time would be pretty rapid. I mean, it seemed like they were just like, uh, you know, we'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, old Joe pieced out immediately, and then the other guys they hung around, kind of just like sh you know shooting the bull uh, for for what seemed like a good amount of time. What that uh, cops definitely could have shown up in, but that's. Uh... 
Yeah, later on I, in the I movie, the they, the cops have a way better response time. Yeah. When they, <laughs> apparently, if there's a vacuum store that's in trouble, then they're right there. But if it's Jesse Pinkman on the loose, then they're like, yeah, we'll take it back. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into Final Summary Review. Uh, Robert, you want to kick us off? And then uh, we'll go to you, Jared. Yeah, sure. Um, I think for me, since I, you know, like I said, I haven't watched it in you know, a good five years. So I think you got to give this movie two scores. One score if you're right up all in the lore and you've just finished watching the series or it's still fresh in your mind. And I think this movie works really well. And it's like a like an eight. I think it's strong. It's a good continuation of the story. I don't think, you know, Gilligan has really lost much of his chops. Um, but for me, since I didn't watch it that way, and maybe it's my own fault, but I, I think if you have to go outside of a movie to help explain the movie, eh, I think you got to ding it, ding it a little bit. Um, like, like you said, if I'd watched the recap, then, you know, maybe that's my fault. Maybe I should have watched the recap, but I think if you hadn't, you know, if, if you have to watch a recap, if you have to go to the Wikipedia page, I think, yeah, I think a movie has to be judged on its own merits. And since I didn't watch all that and it was a little, a little fuzzy for me, then the story didn't. Yeah, I still liked it. I still enjoyed the acting and the the writing, um, but the story was a little bit funky. In that, like I said, I I was just kind of along for the ride, and I didn't really. I wasn't along for the ride, and I was just more just watching it happen. And didn't I wasn't inside Jesse's head, and I wanted to be. I wanted to know what was going on. Like, I just didn't know what was going on. But obviously, our guest knew exactly what was happening. And I think he's going to give it a higher score than I am. And that's perfectly fine. So for me, this movie was like a six. I I bet you if I go back and I ever watch the Breaking Bad universe, the whole series again, I will definitely want to watch this movie again afterwards. Because I remember just devouring Breaking Bad. Man, when I, I binging is, a Yeah. It, I watched like five, six episodes a day. It was out of control. It's such a good show. So then I would definitely watch this at the end of that and uh, probably enjoy it a great deal more than I did. Sounds so, like you were an addict, Robert. Maybe, 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 Daniel, maybe something should be illegal, huh? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So yeah, six and an eight, six and an eight. But it, you, you lose points uh, for that. So anyway, and plus it's been what, five years? No, way longer than that. When did the when did Breaking Bad wrap up? Oh nine. Okay, so ten years ago. So yeah, yeah it's been a long time. That's that's a bit of a gap to finally wrap up this story. But I know they've been doing Better Call Saul in between that. But still, um, I didn't follow the Better Call Saul like I did the Breaking Bad. Although Better I'm Call sure Saul it's... is equally as good as Breaking Bad. Equal. Maybe maybe slightly lower. I mean, I could. The only reason I'm saying that is because it's not finished yet. But I, mm. I mean, I just I like the way Vince Gilligan develops characters. And mm-hmm. Better Call Saul really does a great job of developing, you know, some of the Breaking Bad characters and the other new characters that are introduced in Better Call Saul. Uh, cool. It's a, it's a great show. I'm looking forward to when it's all done and I can watch from the first episode of Better Call Saul all the way through Breaking Bad and then wrapping up with the apex of El Camino. <laughs> is, is Better Call Saul a complete prequel? Like it, it will end and then Breaking Bad will begin? I, I think it's going to end... Uh, well, some people think it's going to end post Breaking Bad with because because Saul uses the vacuum cleaner repair guy too, and mm. uh, and they 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 in the f- opening ep- opening scene of each season so far, it's been like a flash forward to Saul as his in his new life after being disappeared. Mm. Um, so there's speculation that it's going to end there, but it's already kind of starting to overlap with the Breaking Bad world, and there's mm. still I think two seasons left to go. So I'm not really sure where it's going to go. And Gillingen has definitely said that there is a definite endpoint, and he knows the ending of Better Call Saul. Yeah, they, they've got it planned out, from what I understand. That there's two more seasons. The next season's going to start in February, and then there's one more season after that, and that's going to be it. And that's that's still on FX. Is that what you uh, AMC, I believe. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll, I look forward to binging that when that's all done. Yeah, and I'd be interested to see that. Yeah. Um, I. Uh... You know, I, I like I said, Jesse had kind of become my favorite character over time in Better and Breaking Bad, and I went into El Camino knowing that he was going to try to escape, uh, and that it was likely going to be through the vacuum cleaner repair guy. So I kind of had an anticipation of what the story was going to be uh, going into it. I didn't know if he was going to successfully escape. I was actually kind of hoping 
uh, maybe I shouldn't even say this, but I was kind of hoping that he was going to die in the movie. Just, I thought it might've been a better storyline. Um, but Vince did a really Vince Gilligan did a really good job of, you know, bringing that story to its conclusion. That was really the only storyline of breaking bad that hadn't gotten wrapped up. So getting that wrapped up was nice. Uh, I, wasn't sure if he was going to successfully escape or not, like I said. Um, and I guess I, I'm, I'm fine with the fact that he did. I kind of thought, you know, I, I don't know, the, the, the happy, happy ever after type of ending, um, I kind of get a little bored with. But uh, and you know, I, didn't, I totally, but didn't totally buy into the, the flashbacks with Mike and Walt. I thought they felt a little bit forced. Um, but I, like I said, I, I just love this Breaking Bad world, and I it was always going to be hard for me not to like this movie. I'd probably give it a, I think I'd probably give it an eight, um, eight and a half maybe if I was, you know, if I had just watched it or something. All right, very good, eight and a half, pretty generous, pretty generous. Um, I I think that this was uh was really well done. I was a bit in the dark because I hadn't seen the preview or the recollection right before it. I hadn't seen the series in a, a couple of years, but by the end of it, you know, it all came together, and so now. Um, thinking on it, yeah, it, it all makes sense. Kind of what was happening. Some of it does seem to be for plot convenience or to get this character back involved, um, or to you know kind of have a little um, what do you call it? like a little cameo, like a little like favorite recurring character kind of like moment, like a little send off kind of thing. But overall, I think that this was similar to say like a Blade Runner twenty forty nine, where it's sort of made for the fans. This is definitely a made for the fans, and and it almost requires you to be a fan to be able to watch this and actually enjoy it. Um, so I'm going to go with a 7.5, uh, on this. I, I do highly recommend it. If you are a person who has seen all of Breaking Bad, if you have not yet seen Breaking Bad, um, do not watch this movie. Wait until you've seen it all. Binge it all if you can, you know, in a compacted short period of time, and it'll probably be, uh, just really brilliant and all fall into place. But, uh, that's going to do it for, uh, for our discussion on this one. So Jared, thank you for joining us for this and people can find your work at breakingliberty.com And also, uh, is your other site anarcholand.com? Is that correct? That is, uh, the other sites. It's not really doing anything at the moment. Um, but breaking liberty.com, they, anybody can go there and download for free, uh, either of the, uh, eBooks that are currently available with a third on the way. The first, the first one is, about the war on drugs as it relates to the breaking bad world second one's about the cops and the third one uh, is going to be kind of a potpourri of uh, economics and healthcare and education and you know just uh other liberty uh kind of a potpourri of liberty ideas all right that sounds great so. and i think i mentioned to you via chat a while ago that breaking bad was originally going to be shot in california but because of uh onerous union regulations they set the whole series over to New Mexico um, to be able to make it uh, far less costly. <laughs> so that might make a, a good fit for your third book there. Um, but yeah, thanks again for for being our guest. And uh, if you can stick around for our Kathleen Turner Overdrive, we would uh, enjoy that as well. Uh, so everyone, this is uh, lastnerds.com slash 98. We'll be coming back next week doing a Thanksgiving type episode uh, with Tom Hanks on a desert island in Castaway, and we will have the great Keith Knight of Don't Tread on Anyone join us for that one. So we're going to get into Crusoe economics and crush and primism and and commism. It's going to be a lot of fun. He speaks a mile a minute, so there's going to be a huge contrast between him and me, and Robert will be the uh, in-between, I think. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, check out that guy's videos. He is uh, He's intense, and uh, he's got great, great arguments. It's um, he does great work. So, and he's a really young guy, but we're really excited to have him uh, next week for Castaway. Uh, so, Robert, you want to tell them what they can uh, do to support the show if they like it, and then we'll uh, say goodnight from last night. Well, yeah, as always, you guys, uh, you can support us by telling your friends about it. We really just want to spread the message of liberty to everyone and anyone. So, anytime you do that, you are helping yourself and you're helping us. You're just helping everybody on the planet. So do that. And you can also advertise for us by going to trutcher.com and buying a t-shirt or a sticker. You can slap on a bumper or anything like that or on a, a pillow. You can do, you can buy all kinds of crazy stuff on there. Um, and then you can also leave a review on iTunes and that helps our visibility Or You could uh, leave a comment on the YouTube channel. You could subscribe to the YouTube channel. But uh, basically anytime you are talking peace, voluntarism, 
and anarcho capitalism and just peaceful coexistence, you are uh, helping us out. So thank you for that, because I know you do. And um, as we head into the holidays, you're going to be facing your relatives around the uh, Thanksgiving turkey dinner. And uh, if you could mention some liberty to combat all the, the Trump talk and the statism, um, maybe use some against me arguments. That would be that would be really helpful for the cause of liberty, because your family members, generally speaking, <laughs> I mean, maybe they think you're an idiot, but give them some credit. They will consider your words and they respect you. And uh, well, they're related to you. So they got to at least think you have something going on good, right? Because they don't think of themselves as total crap. So yeah, if you can find the guts, I mean, don't, you know, make it so unbearable that everybody, you know, turns into a massive argument and everybody hates everybody. You don't want to do that. This is the time of uh, sharing and being good to one another. But um, yeah, don't just, don't just let people get away with saying a bunch of crap that you know is absolutely wrong. If you can find the guts to do it, that would be wonderful for us. Thank you very much. And we'll uh, catch you next week. All right. Well said, Robert. And uh, yeah, we, we are getting to that period where we all should treat each other with good cheer. And as anarchists, uh, we just think you should do that all the time. But, you know, that's us. Um, but uh, so this is episode uh, 98. So lastnerds.com slash 98. And also found on the Launchpad Media, where they're always launching new ideas, new direction. Check it out at thelaunchpadmedia.com. And we'll say good night from last night. days of the internet, radical libertarians were scattered, lonely, and faceless. Without direction, they resigned to scour the web, sifting through content providers in a wasteland plagued by YouTube demonetization, Facebook jail, and covert internet censorship. But then, in 2017, the Libertarian Union was formed. Finally, the average Joe Libertarian could find a thriving community of independent podcasters and content providers, all in one convenient location. At Libertarian Union, we'll always have the latest news, interviews, discussions, and even movie reviews. With hundreds of episodes and more added all the time, you'll always find something fresh at libertarianunion.com.